Andreas Nielsen. Andreas is, uh, comes from Lund University, and he's going to talk about um, Bayesian approach to Holocene modeling of the geomagnetic field and uh, how that helps us think, I think, see what's reliable. Okay, uh, all yours. See. Thank you, Cathy, and, and thank you for inviting me to this session. Uh, I'm going to talk about westward drift a bit, this will be the focus of the talk, and introduce a new basin approach to Holocene models, and then discuss some of the new features and patterns that we see in this. And this is work done together with Niels Sutti, uh, but also with um, collaborators Kumiko Hori, Monica Corte, Richard Holm, and Mimi Hill. So a brief outline of this talk is, um, first I will give a bit of a background about westward drift and potential mechanisms behind this during the era of direct observations. And then I will show some of the results from our group of looking at westward drift in the Holocene, introduce our new Bayesian modeling approach, and then show some brief results from this new model. So westward drift of the geomagnetic field has been a concept or an observation that's been made a long time ago, the last four centuries we've known about this, but it's not until the advent of models where we can look at the geomagnetic field at the core mantle boundary like this one shown here, that we, we've seen that the westward drift is concentrated specifically in the Atlantic hemisphere. <clears throat> And specific, or mostly it's concentrated in the equator where we're seeing these strong flux patches moving westward at a rate of about 17 kilometers per year. But we also see strong westward drift around the tangent cylinder, which is this imaginary cylinder around the inner core um, um, aligned with the rotation axis. And we see these both in, uh, do you see my mouse when I move it around? Yes. Yes, thanks. So we see them here in the Pacific Hemisphere, but we see also in the, um, in the Atlantic Hemisphere. Now the most prevailing explanation for this is uh, an eccentric planetary gyre that appears in most modern core flow uh, reconstructions. This is a westward jet that circles the tangent cylinder in the Pacific Hemisphere, and then it stretches out towards the equator or the edge of the core in the Atlantic Hemisphere and thereby giving rise to this strong westward drift that we see at the equator in the Atlantic Hemisphere. In this case, this is, the westward drift is caused by advection, so the field lines are carried by the bulk fluid motion. An alternative hypothesis, which was originally proposed by Hyde in 1966, involves the propagation of slow magnetic Rossby waves instead. These are, these are Rossby waves like we see in the atmosphere, that are due to the Coriolis effect, but in the core, we also have the magnetic field. And specifically, this is the azimuthal field or the toroidal field inside the core, which is important. In this case, the westward drift velocity is not the same as the velocity of the fluid. Part of this westward drift would then be uh, explained by wave propagation. And these type of waves are thought to operate on time scales of 100 to 10,000 years and are mostly important in high latitudes of the core. They're very difficult to detect, but they have been detected in dynamo simulations by Hori et al, 2015. And they did this using so-called time longitude plots. So I will be showing these type of plots during the talk. So on the y-axis, we have time and the x-axis is longitude. And in this case, the plot is showing the uh, radial fluid velocity. So perpendicular to the westward drift and westward drift or eastward drift will be shown as diagonal lines in these kind of plots. So westward drift shows as diagonal lines from the bottom right to the top left. And what uh, Hori et al plotted out here where all these the black lines and the, and the black dotted lines are signatures of magnetic Rossby waves riding on top of the uh, core flow, which is the background flow, which is the white dashed lines. Um, they, to identify these magnetic Rossby waves, they use frequency wave number power spectrums. And these are these kind of plots where you look at the frequency on the y-axis and you then separate this uh, into wave numbers on the x-axis. And the wave numbers are, uh, you can think of this as how many wavelengths would fit inside a circle around the core. 
So if you have a wave number of one, m equals one, that's a wavelength of 360 degrees. And then wave number of 10 would be 36 degrees. And the reason these plots are good to isolate magnetic Rossby waves is because these waves are dispersive. Shorter wavelengths will travel, propagate at a faster rate, specifically following this cubic relationship that is plotted along this black line. Whilst the flow by advection, where you have the same phase velocity, no matter what wavelength, spatial wavelength, you would have a linear relationship or a non-dispersive wave, which is the white dashed line here. So by looking at the westward drift signal in terms of in these type of plots, you can separate what is caused by magnetic Rossby waves and what is the background flow. And uh, <clears throat> if you can separate this and you can uh, isolate the wave propagation speed at some wave number, you can then use this information to uh, determine the strength of this hidden toroidal field. And this was done based on some basic assumptions by Hori et al using GFM. And they, uh, this, they came up with a number of 12 millitesla for the toroidal field. But these, this is, could see, be seen as an upper boundary. So if we look at um, the radial field of the, over the past 4,000 years, uh, at the core mantle boundary. Um, and this is now a model PFM 9K.1A, which was produced by uh, our group. Um, we see mostly it's pretty chaotic, but if we look at the Northern hemisphere where we have most data, we see mostly two of these intense flux patches, high latitude intense flux patches moving in a westward direction. And there's also an intermittent occurrence of um, weak or reverse flux that comes up um, every 800 years or so, and they might be migrating from lower latitudes. To study this in more detail, we use these time longitude plots again. And uh, in this case, it's the radial field of the magnetic field, or sorry, the radial field, the core mantle boundary, at 60 degrees latitude north. And I chose this latitude because this is where we see the movement of these intense flux patches and also the appearance of high latitude reverse flux which comes up around 500 BC, 700 AD, and 1900 AD. Again, westward drift would be seen as diagonal lines. We can see two different drift rates, a slower drift rate and a faster one. And this is now, this is now represented by the movement of these intense flux patches. If we wanna do a bit more quantitative analysis of this, uh, we, we filter these models, so these time longitude plots, uh, or actually the models, uh, using a technique developed by Dunbar and Finley, 2007, where we first remove the axisymmetric time average part of the field, and then we high pass filter it to remove variations on longer time scales than 2,500 years. This is a way to look at both eastward and westward drift by removing the quasi stationary features. And I also extended this uh, longitude scale of this plot from minus 360 to 360 degrees. And this is because these drift rates are quite slow. And this, by extending the plot like this, we can see how stable these are through time. So now it's easier to see the slow drift rate. It's not actually only this little part here, but we can actually see it throughout the whole 9,000 years. And we can determine the drift rate to be about 0 0.09 degrees per year with an m equals two structure. That would be the same as saying we have two intense flux patches circling around the, um, uh, the tangent cylinder. Now, if you notice these lines are plotted along red patches, which is actually po this positive residual flux, which if we would go back to the unfiltered model would correspond to weak or reverse flux patches. So this isn't actually movement of the, the lines aren't plotting the movement of the intense flux patches, but rather what's in between. We also see faster drift rates, uh, about 0 0.25 degrees per year. And these are mostly concentrated during the last 3000 years and in the early part of the model, seven or 6,000 BC. Another way to look at this and to look at several latitudes at the same time is to use a radon transform. So the radon transform, it calculates the integrated signal along different angles of this figure. So the different angles translates directly to different drift rates. So if we would sum up the signal along an angle of this drift rate, we would get sign, we would add up positive the same signed flux 
and, uh, and, and attain a, uh, a strong power. Whilst if we would add up along a zero degree, oh, sorry. Uh, along this line, we would have positive, uh, negative, positive, negative, positive will cancel out to a zero, um, to a low power. So that's what we're seeing uh, along the, these, these lines, we'll get a, a positive high power signal. And we also, we see this at 0 0.09 degrees, which is this line and at 0 0.25 degrees per year. And it's a high Northern latitudes around 60 degrees, like we saw before. We also see strong westward drift in the Southern hemisphere, but we think the resolution of the model here isn't really enough to distinguish two distinct drift rates, even if they were there. So I'm going to focus on this part up here. And just to convince you that this isn't just seen in one model, if we look at different models from Constable et al 2016, these two up here, or Helio and Gillet 2018, these ones down here, we see a very similar picture. So we isolate two distinct drift rates, 0 0.25 and 0 0.09 at high northern latitudes. The only model that doesn't really capture the slow drift rate so much is the one that doesn't include sedimentary data which highlights that the sediments are probably quite important to be able to get this high latitude signal at the core. If we then turn to the frequency wave number power spectrum, um, we see these two drift rates would be isolated as the slow drift rate is at 0 0.09 degrees per year, has a frequency of 1, 000, 1 divided by 2000, and the structure of m equals two, that ends up around here. The fast drift rate, m equals one, has a higher frequency. So this is a dispersive relation. Does it not follow the line of advection, which would be a, a linear relationship? And it doesn't either follow the line of uh, wave propagation, uh, the cubic relationship that was predicted by Hyde. But we still think there's a, we think that, that the fact that this is showing a dis dispersive relationship suggests that waves are somehow involved here. And one interpretation, our running hypothesis of this, is that the fast drift rates are representing magnetic Rossby waves riding on top of the background flow, which is represented by this slow drift rate. And if we then use the same calculations at Hori et al, we can isolate the, uh, the um, the phase velocity of this, uh, of the wave propagation to be 0 0.16 degrees per year. So we take 0 0.25 minus 0 0.09. And this would give us a toroidal field strength of about 13 to 14 millitesla at the given core radius, which is fairly similar to what uh, Hori et al gave. Another way of looking at this is that we know that we, we looked at the time longitude plot at 60 degrees and we can decom largely decompose this into two waveforms. So if we think of these two drift rates as two waveforms, even if one of them might represent uh, the background flow, this would give rise to an interference pattern. And we could calculate this. Uh, we'll get a, um, an envelope propagating eastward with a group velocity of 0 0.07 degrees. And, uh, and we'll also get constructive interference about every 1,125 years. So an easy way to look at this is just to think when these drift lines that I plotted along these two waveforms, uh, along the positive residual flux, when they intersect, we will get positive uh, constructive interference. And that's exactly where we're getting this weaker reverse flux at high latitudes of the core. We also see a similar type of periodicity signal around 1,000 to 1,300 years in the dipole tilt. So suggesting that maybe all of this is related. What I want to say here is that if, if these weaker reverse flux patches are lining up, if it's not just by chance, then this, this shows quite a lot of support for this being something involving waves. Now to the new generation of models, uh, we're going to call these PFM 9K.2, second generation. And these are probabilistic set of models uh, where the main aim of these is to attain realistic geometric field variations from sedimentary data where we uh, take into account the uh, smoothing from PDRM lock-in processes. 
we want to use the geomatic field information to synchronize the data with which all have uncertain ages. And we want to try and attain realistic uncertainties on the Gauss coefficients. So to do this, we will uh, we parameterize the ages of all the archimanetic data and the ages of the sediment records. And we also parameterize the, the PDRM of the sedimentary data. So this is post-depositional remnant magnetization. And we end up with a lot of parameters. And the only reason we're able to do this is because of a very efficient Hamiltonian Monte Carlo process, which I'll show a little bit more about. And we're using an implementation through STAN, which you can find here. Briefly about the modeling approach. This is a Markov chain Monte Carlo or MCMC sampling approach uh, where we start off with our parameters. We have our Gauss coefficients, which are defined as Gaussian processes, a multi-normal distribution. The statistical properties are based on the modern field. The archeological ages we assume are normally distributed. And for the sediments, we have parameters uh, that control the age depth model so age and accumulation rates. And we have parameters that control the, the smoothing function, so the locking depth and the shape of this function. And we have parameters that control core orientation. And to start off the model, we will just draw a random set of parameters from the prior distribution of all of these parameters. It's a completely random set of parameters. We go to our forward model, where we calculate the predicted declination, inclination, and intensity for each of our data points. And this is done using spherical harmonic expansion, truncated at degree five. We use the Bacon HDEF model or a modified version of it for the sediment HDEF models. And we use PDRM filter function as defined by Nielsen et al. 2018. We now have our uh, declination, inclination in intensity, and we can calculate model data residuals. So we go to the next block where we calculate the probability of this set of parameters. And this would be a combination of the prior probability so the, from the prior distribution and the likelihood function, which is essentially the model data residuals. This gives us an estimate of uh, how consistent are these set of parameters with the data that we have. And we will then either accept or reject this sample and then go back to the forward modeling, generating a new set of samples that are somehow based on the previous ones. And this is where the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo approach excels because it will use the gradient of the posterior distribution to go into home into the higher density area and also lose all memory from the previous, at least in ideal circumstances, it does that. So it's not a random walk where you'd have to run it for tens or hundred thousands of times and then throw away every hundred thousand iterations. If this works, you would save every iterations and this will loop around for about thousand or 2000 times and we save the last 2000 solutions. This is where I've spent most of my time working to try and get this to work uh, so that we're actually getting reasonable samples and that this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo approach works. And we're now satisfied with this and uh, we're about to submit this as a paper. So to evaluate the model, we're using synthetic data. And synthetic data are generated from uh, um, from the prior, we take a random model, we call this PFM ref, which is drawn from the prior distribution. We draw random ages for the archimanetic data and the sediments, also from their prior distributions, and then random parameters to uh, determine how lock-in, how filtered these should be, uh, how, how much the lock-in depth is, and so on. We then use our forward model, calculate the, um, the inclination, declination, intensity for our data, where we have data, real data and then corrupt this with realistic noise. And then we try to run the model to recover these true parameters that we know in this case. And this is an overview of where we have data. We're using all the archimanetic data in GeoMagia and then eight sediment records at the moment. So an example with archimanetic data, how we can use the geomagnetic field to synchronize the data. In this case, we've got um, archimanetic data around Paris the true intensity variation is the green line. The red lines are the 95% credible interval of our model trying to recover this green line, basically. Uh, I've taken out one of these data points as an example, which is shown with the H distribution is shown here. 
So here we have an input age of minus 585, which is the center of this prior distribution and a standard deviation of 176 years, which determines the width of the prior. And what the model is doing, it's using the geomagnetic field information. We have a high intensity value. It wants to push it to either younger or older ages to fit with the other data. And in this case, it's pushing it to younger ages towards the true age in this case, which is 300 BC. A similar example from sedimentary data, this is from Lake Biva in Japan, where our prior H-step model, in this case, the Bacon H-step model, is the dashed lines here, which was constrained by two data horizons. And once we add the geomagnetic field information, we're able to constrain this, update this distribution, the posterior, uh, to basically fit around this green line, which is the random, the reference value that we drew out. So this, this is showing it works really well. And it's doing this despite that uh, the data we have here are filtered with a lock-in filter around 12 centimeters, a half lock-in depth of around 12 centimeters. So in this case, the inclination, the green line is the true inclination variation. And the uh, data are the black dots here. And they're showing this smooth variation, which we would get if we, if we have a lock-in filter in play. So the model is recognizing this and uh, assigning a lock-in filter, a lock-in depth of around 10 to 20 centimeters to be able to reconcile it with other archaeomagnetic data, mostly from the last 2000 years up here. So <clears throat> to look at the recovery of the Gauss coefficients, uh, we're using um, two diagnostic tools. So the normalized dispersion is defined as the standard deviation of the posterior of a given Gauss coefficient divided by the standard deviation of the prior, so normalized by the prior. This, this gives us an estimate of the precision. Um, and what I'm showing here is the time, root mean square time average normalized dispersion and error for each spherical harmonic degree. So I've ordered these by spherical harmonic degrees and, and then average over time. So these two the circles here are the uh, normalized dispersion. And what we see is we get increasing value as we go up to degree five. So once we reach about a value of about one, this means that we're not adding any information to the model. So it's reverting back to the prior distribution. Uh, but what we see is that we have, um, actually, even if we're only got eight sediment records, the sediment model is providing, they're providing quite a lot of information here compared to the archimnetic model. The other parameter we're using is the normalized error. And this is the, um, the difference between the posterior mean and the reference value. So it's showing the error of the model and it's normalized by the standard deviation of the posterior. So this would have an expected value of one and it gives us an estimate of the accuracy of this model. And we're seeing that we're getting mostly around one for all our Gauss coefficients, all our different degrees, which means that we have realistic errors, at least given these assumptions. Now I should say all these tests are based on the priors that we assign. So it's all based on the assumption that, um, that these priors are realistic. And of course they're probably not. So, but at least they show that the model is internally consistent. So if we go back to the time longitude plots and the westward drift, and I'm now showing the new results from this new model with real data. We're looking at 60 degrees north again, unfiltered model and then filtered same way as before. And in this last panel, I'm showing the signal to noise ratio because now we have an ensemble of models and we can look at how strong is the signal, uh, what's the robust information here. And what we're seeing is that because of the, the lack of sedimentary data in this model, we're only actually getting some reasonable values in the filtered model this is for the last 3000 years. And then prior to that, it's, it's mostly noise. Still, we see that uh, we're, we're getting quite reasonable fit with the previous. These are the drift lines that I show in the previous figures. So fast drift rates and the slower drift rate might be a bit less apparent. If we look at it a bit more quantitatively using this radon transform, so looking at uh, the integrated power along different angles of the t uh, time longitude plot, we again see a strong signal around 0 0.09 degrees and 0 0.25 degrees. We can home in on 60 degrees north. 
and look at the different models. So the diff each gray line here is an, an individual model from our ensemble. And what we're seeing in this figure is that all of the models are showing these two distinct drift rates. So these are, are robust features. They're not just something that comes out in the mean. And if we compare it to the previous generation model, we're also seeing a shift in power from the slow drift rate towards the, the, the higher drift rate. And this isn't so surprising because this is the purpose of this new model that we're synchronizing the ages and we're taking into account smoothing of the sediment records by PDRM processes. So the model, the new model is able to capture much faster variations than the previous one. If we compare the time longitude plot of the previous uh, generation model, PFM 9K.1A, with the new model, we're seeing some interesting shifts here. And I would highlight this part here, which is a fast drift rate of around 0 0.45 degrees, uh, an intense flux patch moving from beneath Europe to North America around 500 BC. And in the previous generation model, this didn't really show up. It showed up as a, an intense flux patch in Europe and then beneath Europe that disappeared and then we got an intense flux patch beneath North America. If we look at the frequency wave number power spectrum, we're seeing something similar to the previous generation. We have these two different drift rates or waveforms. Uh, uh, it's now dominated by this faster drift rate, the 0 0.25 um, degrees per year signal, M equals one. But we're also seeing the slower drift rates and we're now seeing some faster drift rates as well, like this one here, also M equals one. But to conclude, the new model is better at resolving faster drift rate signals, but we would still need better spatial resolution to be able to test this wave hypothesis. We would like to resolve something at M equals three where we can predict the, um, the, um, the frequency based on this relationship that we've um, hypothesized. If we go back to this wave interference plot, so now looking at the unfiltered model, and we uh, plot the, wave, the drift lines just as they've been uh, plotted before, following positive residual flux or weak or reverse flux in the unfiltered model. Where these intersects, we intersect, we have constructive interference, and we get the appearance of these weak or reverse flux patches at high latitudes. So the pattern for the last 3,000 years is, is the same as the previous model. But what we're also seeing is that maybe, maybe this is something that, that stretches back, not just the last 3,000 years, but the last 9,000. But at least in this early part, it looks a bit like that. We've got similar kind of weak reverse flux appearing around the time where we're predicting it with this. It kind of breaks down between 4,000 and um, 1,000 BC. If we compare this to the uh, dipole component of the field, we again see a strong relationship, at least for the last 3,000 years, with the dipole tilt. So when we, have, when we have this constructive interference of our inferred waveforms, we also have um, a strong dipole tilt. Uh, but what we're also seeing in this new model is that maybe these are also linked to a weak dipole moment. We know presently we have a weak dipole moment. And around 900 years ago, there was something similar. But this is a very tiny dip, of course. And here, uh, around 700 BC, as a minimum in the dipole moment in our model, which is slightly out of phase with this, but um, maybe, maybe this is uh, still related. Now, one interesting thing here is that this is showing the re weaker reverse flux at northern latitudes. But there's recent work by Sayoa Camposano showing that the South Atlantic anomaly it evolved synchronously in the southern and, nor and uh, northern hemisphere. So perhaps this northern patch is related to the weak, uh, to reverse flux patches in the southern hemisphere. And maybe these are, uh, these are related processes and that we should expect similar things as we go back in time. And an interesting analog to this is around 700 BC, where we're seeing very uh, strong reverse flux patch in the Northern Hemisphere. And when we look at the surface maps, this looks a bit like the South Atlantic anomaly. I'll show in the next slide. It's a bit like a mirror image of the South Atlantic anomaly. So maybe what this 
interference pattern is showing are recurrent large scale field asym asymmetries. I don't know. If this is all related to the wave hypothesis, I'm also unsure. Uh, it would be nice to tie all this together, but maybe, maybe it's just coincidences. The alternative hypothesis here is that maybe we're dealing with something like the uh, planetary uh, gyre uh, that's coming and going or being more or less eccentric. But I think this pattern of that these are appearing in this type of order predicted by these waveforms suggests that maybe there are some waves involved here instead. So this is the image I was talking about, this North Pacific anomaly, 700 BC, that looks, here we're looking at the Pacific hemisphere, and it looks a bit like a mirror image of the South Atlantic anomaly today. These are now intensity that our surface. So to conclude, um, this new model, it supports the previous observations of two distinct westward drift rates at high northern latitudes, but we would still require better spatial resolution to prove or disprove the wave hypothesis. And our plan to move forward here is to get more sedimentary data from the Arctic region. And this was recently funded a project with the Swedish Research Council in collaboration with Joe Stoner, Matta Reagan, Arjen Gustafsson and more, where we will attain more cores from some of these locations and they already published data in some of these to try and include this, put these into the model. And we might have to use a regional model approach to be able to do this, to push this to higher, uh, higher um, or smaller wavelengths. And using uh, Kathy Constable's uh, code of the green function, we can map what, what we're going to map at the core mantle boundary. And it's, it's just around this uh, circle here, 60 degrees north. And so this would give us a lot of information about these waves, potentially waves. We're also going to look for uh, magnetic Rossby waves using different models at different time ranges and alternative techniques. And this is work presently being conducted together with Kumiko Hori. And lastly, we want to explore alternative hypothesis um, that this is all due to advection by core fluid. And to do this, we want to develop a similar type of basin approach for millennial scale core flow models. And this would be done with Alexander Fournier. So thank you very much. Thanks, Andreas, for that uh, really impressive uh, putting together of uh, old and new thoughts here. Um, I, uh, Put this open for questions. I see Lisa has a question in the chat. Do you want to ask it directly, Lisa? Sure. Um, I, I just was curious, you're solving for um, the lock and depth, and I like that approach. And I'm just curious what kind of values you got. For the lock in depth? Mm -hmm. uh, we're getting. Um, half lock in depth, so uh, where 50% of the signal would be locked in. Mm -hmm. It varies from almost zero mm -hmm. centimeters. Uh, I never get quite zero, but uh, around that, uh, up to about 10 to 20, quite normal. There's some of these Swedish lakes where it's pushing it up to 30 mm -hmm. uh, or 40 centimeters, which is quite a lot. Oh, and these are all lakes. Oh, I these see are, um, no, they're not all lakes. There's some marine sites as well. Yeah, be curious. Um, relationship between the two because I would think that in marine sediments you'd have a thinner lock in depth than in lakes that's just a guess based on flocculation theory I don't know. yeah um, I guess we're simplifying it slightly now we're not we're not looking either at the bioturbation depth in a bit, because this was developed originally for sediments uh, lake sediments where we didn't have that um, but um, we're, we're, leaving, we're leaving it open to the model to decide. We assign the same prior to all of the different records. This could, of course, change. But um, uh, And so far, I think the marine sites that I, uh, that I looked at, Beaufort Sea, for example, is I think it's Core 803 uh, from Beaufort Sea, Barletta, mm -hmm. 2010 or 9, I forget. And then it's this uh, uh, Icelandic record um, but, uh, from Joe Stoner, 2007. MD 29, MD 99, 2269, I think. Mm -hmm. But those are both quite high resolution, which means that the locking depth doesn't actually have a huge influence. If you have a high resolution site and, you, and you, the model assigns it 30 centimeter locking depth, it doesn't actually do that much smoothing compared to some of the lake sediments that we have. Actually, I've got a related question, and that is, um, I know that when Sanya was making the HFM models, she 
invested a lot of energy in estimating uh, smoothing and lock-in depths. And I was wondering if you've looked at how your results with this method com uh, compare with what she got from her spline estimation. Do you, do, do you do that? Uh, I know which paper you're talking about. No, I haven't, I haven't looked at that. That's a good idea to have some. Yeah, uh, I think it would be the... interesting to see the in whether there's internal consistency or not. Yes, yes. Or external consistency. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm quite, um, uh, I, I, I would trust more this approach when we have uh, mm -hmm. sediment records from the Northern Hemisphere where there's lots of data around. Uh, mm -hmm. Where it's less trustworthy is when we get uh, sediment records isolated in the Southern Hemisphere and there's no other data really to steer it in the right direction, then it might just uh, try to conform with what the archimetric data would predict. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, so I have another question, or, mm -hmm. and, and that is um, looking at your intention to go and get more high latitude data. I think that's great because obviously we know that uh, if you don't have the high latitude data, then you can't image what's going on in the, around the pole. Um, your, one of the things we've seen is that if you don't have intensity data from high latitudes, then there's a tendency for the um, reverse flux patches that you see in the northern hemisphere in the modern field to get displaced southwards. And I'm wondering if you want to comment on whether that would have an impact on what you've talked about here. Um. We are actually not including any uh, any intensity data from sediments at the moment. Maybe that's what where you what you were getting at. But um, but we're still getting very similar results to our previous generation model in terms of mm -hmm. uh, where these reverse flux patches appear. Uh, I haven't looked into it in more detail. Um, I, I guess I was thinking it might be a problem actually for all models <laughs> because yeah, yeah. there just aren't that many intensity data at high latitudes and the whole data distribution even in the northern hemisphere is very much uh, centered on kind of mid to mid mid latitudes with not an awful lot of stuff higher than about 55 or 5 degrees or something like that. Mm. No, that's that's uh, that's a fair point. The the intensity of the sediment records is something that I've left because this is to to the the approach here is that we want to have um we, we have to fit the data within their uncertainties, otherwise everything mm -hmm. breaks down. And with the sediment uh, relative pale intensities, this has always been difficult with the regularized models. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so um, either we assign really large uncertainties, but I think it'll be nicer to do this properly to try and actually um, have some kind of depth variable normalization or something. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to solve it. But. <coughs> I have an another question putting on my magic database hat. Uh, we don't have a place right now in the database for models, but a lot of people have been collecting them in ERDA and um, I, and I've been putting them into PMAGPI. And a problem that I have, of course, is that everybody, each different uh, group puts them in a different format and it's painful to just kind of munch them all into a consistent format. <laughs> So perhaps we have a consistent format and, and somehow connected with Fiesta, uh, incorporate all these different models and make it easier to maintain and people would contribute their own model in a consistent format. And then it can be used, you can, it's easier for people other than yourself to compare different models and, and uh, different outcomes. I think that sounds like a great idea. Um, Me too. The, the question is, well, I, I leave the question of the format to somebody else, but uh, but I would I would happily um, um, upload them in, in a given format. Yeah, just getting them in in a consistent place first of all is a nice thing. So if you put it into Erda, where a lot of the other ones are, um, then at least we can find them without having yeah. to ask people to. Uh, for the for the data set and then it's just very slow and cumbersome. <laughs>